in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So all of us at some point in our lives more than likely have had a desire for something. And, you know, with it being Youth Sunday, you know, my question is, I wonder how many of us had childhood desires that we no longer have? And a lot of times as a child, when we have desires, we're told, well, you can't have that and you can't do that. And, you know, it don't work that way. And so sometimes we have desires and we have wants and we have things that we wish for that just seem to disappear and just fade away. And, and Jesus said something about entering into his kingdom. He said, you have to become like a little child. And so I want you, some of y'all can go back because it wasn't that far, but some of y'all, you, you got to really, really go back to get back to what was it like when I was a child? What was I wishing for? What was I wanting? What was I desiring? And why did I stop desiring it? You know, I, I, I think a lot of us sometimes we want this perfect world. We want a great world, a beautiful world, a place of, of peace. Does anybody desire peace? Anybody desire joy? You know, anybody have a, a desire and, and, and a passion to be something, to have a purpose? You know, it, we don't all just desire a big car and a big house and money or a wife or, or a husband or all these things. But there's other things that we desire, some basic things, you know, like, like my, one of my sons, he would always say, Daddy, I just want some peace and quiet. And he just made me laugh, you know. He just, in our house, when, when our kids were growing up, it was noise everywhere. But then as they got older, they started to be real quiet. They put the headsets on, the earbuds in, and we don't even hear a sound. I'm like, wow, what have happened to that desire to run around and to make noise and to jump up and down? That just fades away. But there are some desires that we have that are good, and there's also some desires that we have that are not so good. And we want to deal with all of those today. Paul is writing this letter not to the church, he's not writing this letter to his mother or his, or, his, or his sister, but he's writing this letter to Timothy, a young man in the faith who's trying to deal with the church. And so as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, we have to remember who he's talking to. He's talking, this is the elder talking to the younger. And so for those of you who are elders, this might be some help for you to how to talk to people that are younger than you. And we want to talk about three things. We talk about word desire, no desire, and new desire. And when we start out with this thing, talking about word desire, you might have to go back, you know, because some of us at a time in our lives, we had a desire for the word. And then somewhere along the way, we lost that desire for the word. And what we're talking about when we say the word in the Greek, the logos, we're talking about the word of God. And not only just the physical written word, but also the living word, who was Jesus Christ. He is the word that became flesh, is what John 1.14 says. And so those of us who had a desire for Jesus have a desire for the word. And for some of us, that desire was temporary, and some of us, that desire was long term. And for others of us, maybe that desire was interrupted and you picked it back up somewhere along the way. But where is your word desire on a scale of 1 to 10? How much do you desire the word of God? How much do you desire the truth? Because when you desire the word of God, when you desire the truth, then you're desiring freedom. Because the scripture says in John, uh, I believe it's in, uh, dang, is it John chapter 6 or John chapter 8? Y'all going to have to go back and help me. But somewhere in there he says the truth shall make you free. I want to say it's John chapter 8, somewhere around the 30th verse, somewhere in there. But when we desire the truth, yeah, 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 it'll make you free. So we're going to talk about some truths here because we, we really want to get free. We really don't like being bound up in bondage. But here in 2 Timothy, here's a truth that a lot of us really don't like. It's, this is a truth. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, did it say might be? Did it say it's a possibility? Did it say if you, if you, if you desire it long enough, then you'll be concerned? But it says if you desire to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. Man, we don't like that. We don't like to be persecuted. 
We don't like going through anything. We don't like anybody saying anything bad about us. We want everybody to think the best of us and say good things and nice and kind things. We want to walk into the house of God and everybody look, you look good today. You look sweet, lovely, and kind. You want to go to the restaurant this afternoon and get treated nice or go to somebody's house and have a nice dinner and nobody say anything bad about you. But it doesn't work that way, does it? Paul is telling Timothy, don't think that being a Christian is easy. Don't think following Jesus is a cakewalk. Don't think that everybody's going to be nice to you all the time. They're not. If you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, it's like going the opposite way on the freeway. Because everybody else is not trying to be godly. The majority are living ungodly. He says, wide and broad is a way that leads to destruction, and straight and narrow is a way that leads to life. If you're trying to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. That means you will be made fun of. That means you will be mistreated. You might be cheated if you desire to live a godly life. And what I love about this is you don't have to actually have to live a godly life. All you got to do is desire it. See, that's how deep this thing is. All you got to do is start desiring. You know what? I want to do the right thing. I want to change my life around. The minute you start desiring to do the right thing, the persecution is going to come. Why are you thinking like that? Why are you talking like that? Why are you acting like that? No, everything's fine. Just stay how you are. Keep on tracking towards hell like the rest of us. But it's the Holy Spirit that taps you on the shoulder. It's the Holy Spirit that whispers in your ear saying, go this way. But I need you to know something. It's not going to be easy going this way. But I want to clue you in on something. Stuff that's not easy doesn't necessarily hurt for you. I hope you all get this. Stuff that's not easy doesn't necessarily have to be hard for you. See, I remember coming through grade school and I would get to a problem. I'd say, man, this is hard. And I'd put my hand up. And the teacher would come down there, well, what is it, Emmanuel? And I'd say, I can't get this. And she would show it to me. She would explain it to me. And I would say, oh, that's easy. And she would walk back to her seat. And then a little while later, I'd be get to another problem, and I'd just, I'd throw my hand up. And, and, and sometimes I'm the only one that needs help. But the truth is, that wasn't the truth. The truth is, everybody else was too proud to raise their hands. They're too ashamed to raise their hands. They want everybody to think they're smart and to think they know it all, and they don't know nothing. When I looked at my grades and I had 100, and everybody else was coming in saying, I got a 40, and I got a 30, and I'm like, all you had to do was raise your hand. Don't you desire to know the truth? Don't you desire to get it right? Don't you desire just one up there that can get it right for you? He can guide you. He'll walk with you and talk with you. And he'll, he'll tell you you are his own. It's something about when you raise your hand and say, God, I need you. It's something about raising your hand and say, God, come to me. God, I ain't got it all together. God, I need your help. I wish a few of the students in the class would throw their hand up every now and then and say, God, come to me. You're not ordering him to come to you. You're not making him come to you. But it's a sign of surrender, saying, I need you, God. I'm not the smartest one. I'm not the most anointed one. I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I need your help. I listen to that song sometimes, that help song, Lord, I need your help. I believe that. Whoever wrote that, they've, they've been in that situation. The word of God promises us persecution. So why wouldn't we raise our hand when we're being persecuted to make it easier? We invite God into the problem. We invite God into the situation. We invite God into the trouble. He don't make the trouble go away, but it almost seems like the trouble ain't there no more. When God shows up. It's like when big bro show up and they done get ready to gang on you and big bro show up. Man, I'm going to tell you, my, my friends were scared of my big brother. I love it too. 
Because I didn't have to worry about nothing. I know I said, if it, my big brother close around, I'm in good shape. And it's the same way with Jesus. He's our big brother. He done been there before. They said they hated me first. They're going to hate you too. But Jesus know how to make them scatter. Jesus know how to make them run. And Jesus knows how to deal with the persecution. It don't bother him because he knows it's all lies anyway. All they're doing is telling lies. He told this to his disciples, Luke 10 and 19. He says, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Did you know that being hurt is a choice? Being hurt is a choice. Some of y'all might get this on the way home. Nobody can hurt you. You have to choose to say, I'm hurt. People can say all kind of stuff about you. People can do all kind of things to you. But you have to choose and say, I'm hurt. Now, you might be cut. You might be lied on. You might be beaten on. But you have to choose to say, I'm hurt. That's a choice. It's some people that, that go through life and people look at them and say, they must be crazy. Don't they know what they're saying about him? Don't you know what they're doing behind his back? No, they just choose not to be hurt. They choose not to be a victim and they choose to be a victor. I don't care what you throw at me. And I got the full armor on. We've got a shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts from the wicked one. We've got a helmet of salvation to cover our head. We've got a sword of the spirit. He gives us all these things, a belt of truth when people lie on you. You got to use it, though. And if you desire the word of God and you desire the truth, the truth is nobody can hurt you. Nobody can hurt you. He didn't say it wouldn't be scorpions and serpents. He just said you'll be walking on top of them. He didn't say you wouldn't have enemies. He just said they'll be your footstool. He didn't say there wouldn't be trouble and chaos, but he said, I will be with you even until the ends of the earth. Job, Job said it this way. He said, even though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Job was, was, was persecuted beyond measure, but he didn't sit down and say, I'm hurt. Oh, I'm depressed. He, he didn't do like his wife. You know, it looks bad right now. I believe that the end of this is near and a new beginning is coming. I trust you, God. I heard a commentator say last night on, on the football game, he said, every champion is a contender that never gave up. You don't get to be the champ just because you showed up, but you got to keep fighting and keep fighting and never give up. You know, when I was a kid on the playground, I remember, man, if, if you got a cut or, or anything bad happened, you had to come off the playground. And I remember as a kid, we, would, we got a bloody, a bloody, we would lick it and suck it up and keep right on going because we didn't want the teacher to make us go inside. You got to go to the health room. We wanted to keep on playing. So even though it looked like we was hurt, we weren't hurt. We were like, oh, we good. We didn't need no band-aids and we didn't need no first aid kit or none of that stuff. All we needed was a little lick. A little spit. It's amazing what you can do with a little saliva and keep right on going and be all right. And some of you mothers, y'all have walked up to your kids and they crying and going on and on. You go in there and let me kiss it and make it better. You kiss them and all of a sudden they fine. They wasn't hurt in the first place. It's just a mind game that the enemy plays with us. Want us to think that we hurt. Want to think that we down. Want to think that we can't do anything about our situation when we really can if we have the desire. Scripture says, Proverbs 21, 10, the soul of the wicked desires evil. His neighbor finds no mercy in his eyes. Somebody who desires the word of God, that desires the truth, is not trying to do you in or do you wrong. I want to tell you there's going to be people out here that are going to have bad intentions for you. They have a desire to hurt you, to put you down. I know it's football season, and I, and I remember when I was growing up as a kid, I used to love to watch Ronnie Lott, number 42 for the San Francisco 49ers. Ronnie Lott would come down there, and he would try to knock somebody's head off. A lot of the stuff he did, they made it illegal now. They would find you and put you out for the stuff that he did, but it was legal back then. He would try to hurt you. And there are people in life that are just that careless, just that cold. 
they're not concerned about your well-being, they will try to take your spiritual head off. They have no desire for God, no desire to, to love the neighbor as their self. They want to bury their neighbor and take what their neighbor has as their own. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13, Paul tells Timothy, he says, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being, this blows my mind. He says that, that evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. He doesn't say they go from good to bad. They never was good. They never had good intentions. They're going from bad to even worse than what they were. And there's something about your desire is supposed to draw you to the light and draw you to God. But there are some people that have a desire for darkness and it draws them in. I, I don't understand what it is about somebody who, who loves evil that much. That they, can, that they can go into the detention center for what they got in trouble for and they still doing more of that in the detention center, in the prison. And it blows my mind. But it's supposed to be the Department of Corrections. But for some people, correction doesn't work. They continue to do more and more evil, more and more wickedness until they come face to face with the truth. Luke 5, 39, it says something. It's really powerful what it says. But there's, there's, there's several different accounts of what Jesus says about putting new wine in the old wineskins. And y'all know the parable. If you put new wine in the old wineskins, what happens? It will burst. Because you got this new active wine in this old skin that's relaxed and it, it can't handle it. And it bursts. And so the new wine is spilt out. And the old wineskin is burst. So you got a loss of the wineskin and you got a loss of the wine. So if you've got new wine, he says, you put it in new wineskins. And he says that in Matthew, he says it in Mark. But when he gets in Luke, he adds one more thing. And if you look at verse 39 of Luke chapter 5, the new thing that he adds, he says this. He has someone who has tasted and drank the old wine will have no desire for the new. Huh. So what are you trying to say here? When you get that old wine, you get used to that old wine, you don't want the new wine. And I thought, I said, well, maybe he's saying the old wine is better because, you know, that aged wine is better. But, but he, he's not even talking about the taste, but he's talking about our behaviors and our habits. When we get to used to doing things one way, we don't want a new way. It's a lot of y'all elderly in here. Y'all didn't want to get no mobile phone. You didn't want to text. You didn't want to do social media. It was one thing after another. You didn't want to cruise control. You thought somebody was going to die. You know, all of these things, these conveniences, technology keeps coming up with, you didn't want these things because we like the old way better. And some of you right now, you're just like you were when you first accepted Christ. You ain't changed since then. Oh, Lord, I'm, I ain't getting no amens on that. <laughs> I ain't getting no amens. I'm looking for a crack or crevice somewhere amen might come out of. But you're just the same as you were when you accepted Christ. And you say, well, if he accepted me, why do I have to get better? He already accepted me. I'm in now. Why should I have a desire to do godly things and go through persecution? He already accepted me. But the scripture also says this, faith without works is dead. So your salvation is dead. You, you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart, but you didn't do nothing with your hands, so you have a dead faith. It doesn't work. He says, Matthew 5, 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. He says, you're blessed when you go through the persecution. Blessed when you actually follow me for real. Blessed when you start walking the walk and talking the talk and people start talking about you. You are blessed. The same word that evil that he uses in Matthew 5 and 11 is the same word for evil that's used in 2 Timothy 3 and 13 as a connection between these evil people that Paul is talking about to Timothy and the evil people that Jesus is talking about. It's the same kind of evil. It's not, a, it's not just a, you know, oh, you evil. No, no. This is like a kill, steal, and destroy type of evil. I mean, take you out kind of evil. We don't want to think about that. 
We want to think that that stuff is past and gone, you know, when, when slavery times was here. But that evil is still here. And the Bible says that evil has grown from bad to worse. So it looks like we're in a better shape. It looks like people have gotten kinder and nicer. But that's the devil's scheme. That's how he does things. He wants things to appear one way so that he can stab you and destroy you another way. See, if the devil can kill a thousand people without anybody knowing he did it, wouldn't he do it that way? Our people are dying left and right, going to prison left and right, and we don't even know it. We think it was just by random happenstance, but we have to recognize there are evil forces at work in the earth. And the worse and the more evil that people get, the harder it is to catch them because they get good at it. They get better at it. I know guys that went into prison, they was kind of bad, but they came out even worse because they had 10 other crooks that taught them more ways to cheat people and do people in and get away with it. <laughs> Man, you, you want to learn some stuff? I'm going to tell you, y'all need to come down there with me. I'm going to tell you, y'all going to figure out ways to get around your taxes, get around paying for your house, get around cheating on your spouse. You can do all kind of things if you want to. There's a place you can learn that, but you won't learn that in God's word. The last thing that, that I got to tell you, and I got to get out of here, verse 14, he says this. He says, but as for you. See, all of this is building up. Paul has to tell you this is what the bad looks like. So now let me tell you what you're supposed to do. See, it's, it's, it's one thing to, to know what you're supposed to do, but you need to know how ugly it can get. You need to know how bad it can get. This is why they train people to look for counterfeit bills, you know, because sometimes when, when people come in with a bill, I was at the store yesterday and a little girl had brought in a $100 bill and they wouldn't take it. They said, oh, we can't take this. And then, and then they said, oh, the reason why we don't have no change when we put the money in the drawer, they came up with all these different excuses. But a lot of times people don't trust it because they get so many counterfeits. And the counterfeits are getting so good now that they'll come up with an excuse rather than to take a chance on it because they don't know you might have fooled them real good. But, but Timothy, he's, he's a young minister, and he probably has seen other ministers getting away with stuff. And Paul is like, look, I don't want you to do this stuff just because you can get away with it. See, you can preach in a pulpit and be any kind of terrible person because most people don't know your private life. They don't know what you do behind closed doors. They don't know what you do on the weekend when nobody's around. They don't know what you do on your 30-minute break at work. But God knows. So Timothy has to understand, but as for you. See, everybody else is getting away with this stuff, so it seems. Everybody else can do what they want to, so it seems. But he says, as for you, he's talking to somebody. Don't let your coworkers and your family members and other people that you've seen in the church confuse you and fool you. Those are counterfeits. They're not the real thing. There are counterfeit churches all over America. Hold up, let me check that. There are counterfeit churches all over South Carolina. Hold up, let me check that. There's counterfeit churches all over Greenville. And if we're not careful, we'll be one of them. If we're not careful, we will be serving in a counterfeit church, a phony, a fake one. Paul has to warn Timothy but as for you, he wouldn't have had to warn Timothy if he knew Timothy, in no, in no chance Timothy was going to go that way. But all of us are susceptible to go that way. All of us are susceptible to the enemy's tricks because it's easier that way. No persecution, no pain, it's easy, do what you want to do. Got it made. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it. See, it's powerful when you know God has been teaching you. It's powerful when you've been getting your instructions directly from Jesus. I'm not talking about your Sunday school teacher. I'm not talking about your deacon or your pastor. I'm talking about the scriptures, the word of God. When you got a word desire and your word is teaching you and feeding you, the Holy Spirit teaches what scripture. We are just facilitators for the Holy Spirit to blow through. But when the Holy Spirit is teaching you and you know, I know this is from God. I know this is from the Holy Spirit. Don't let anybody turn you from that. Just because you got older and more intelligent and more, more, more sophisticated with your mind, don't, don't forget that those 
basic elementary scriptures for God so loved the world. He didn't hate the world. So why we go around? Oh, look at them people. Look at them nasty people. Look what they're doing. God loved the world. Oh, well, they, they, they cheating on their wives and, 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 and they got feminine ways and, 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 and they be stealing and, and they be cheating. And God loved the world. Do, do, do y'all understand what I'm saying? Oh, but he do drugs and, uh, and, and he smoke cigarettes. God loved the world. I mean, oh, 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 and I know what she did last week, and I know what he was doing over a couple years ago. He ain't changed. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. I don't care what somebody's doing. God loves them. And you're talking about one of the people that God loves. You're talking about somebody that God loves. You're putting down somebody that God loves. You're turning your back on somebody that God loves. You have to have a desire for people that God has a desire for. So much that he sent his son for them. The Bible don't say nothing about smoking cocaine or, or smoking marijuana or smoking cigarettes. It don't mention any of that. But we want to make a rule out of it. But what are you doing? And what, and what sins are you committing that the Bible does talk about? Don't let me go there. I don't have to go far. I can start at the first one. If it's love God with all your heart, your soul, mind, and your strength. In Matthew chapter 9, and I got to get out of here. In Matthew chapter 9, God called one of his disciples. And if you go back and read it, his name is Matthew. But the Bible says that he was a publican. Now, that's not a word that we use every day. If we were to use that word, we would say, he worked for the IRS. <laughs> he was a tax collector. And how many of y'all like the IRS? How many of y'all love to get on the phone with the IRS when they're trying to collect taxes from you? Or if you got a past due tax bill and you're looking forward to talk to the tax collector. Matthew was a tax collector. Jesus looked at him and said, you, follow me. And it says immediately following that many tax collectors and sinners gathered around Jesus and reclined at the table. And the Pharisees walked in there and said, look at him. He's in there with sinners and tax collectors. <laughs> now, now, now y'all know that salvation power is not dependent upon age. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, it doesn't depend. Upon. And we also know that salvation power does not depend upon race. It doesn't matter what color you are. Salvation power does not depend upon any of these discernible things on the outside. But one thing that salvation power does require is this. It requires a sinner. Jesus told the Pharisees this. He said, those that are whole have no need for a physician. Those that are whole have no need for a physician. So in other words, why would I sit down at a table with a whole bunch of people who think they're whole and righteous? Because they don't need anybody. They're already whole. He said, I didn't come to call those who are righteous to repentance, but I came to call sinners to repentance. So who do you expect Jesus to be around? Sinners. But get this. They didn't know they were sinners, too, because he hung around with them. See, they were looking at him hanging around at this table saying, oh, he over there with the sinners. But guess what? When he get up from that table and go to sit at their table, guess what? He's still sitting with sinners. Any table you go to in the lunchroom, is some sinners in there. I remember being in middle school, high school, they whipping. Oh, they table over there. They, we better than them. and Ain't nobody in the lunchroom, ain't no table better than the other table. I don't care what kind of letters you got on your jacket. I don't care what kind of team you a part of. I don't care what kind of association you a part of. I don't care what GPA you got. You a sinner. Tell me you're not. Because the Bible says you are. Jesus said, I came for sinners. There's all of us. <laughs> but guess what? The good news is this. Sinners still have a desire for Jesus. You think just because somebody is sinning that they don't want Jesus? They want Jesus more than you want him. 
Jesus told the Pharisees that the prostitutes are going to enter into the kingdom before you will. They wanted Jesus more than the Pharisees did. The publicans wanted Jesus. They was looking for Jesus, hanging out with Jesus, spending time with Jesus. I'm tell you right now, I've been pastoring here at this church for 13 years. I'm going to tell you, the most of the people that are drawn to me is sinners. Save people don't hang around me. They don't want to be around me. Because I will remind them real quick that you're a sinner. Well, I almost cussed. Because I, I get angry about self-righteous people. I get angry about people who think they got it all together. I get angry when they put themselves above somebody else and they want it more than you do. I don't go down to the prison and preach down there and teach down there just because. I go down there because they want the word. It's some sinners down there that recognize that they're sinners. And they want God. They are hungry for the word. Somebody told me, homie, we need to start feeding the homeless. And I said, man, they don't want Jesus. I'm going to tell you, it's, they don't want the word. People that are homeless, most of them have no desire. Every now and then it's an outlier. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you some trouble. Most of them do not want it. Talked about you got desire, no desire, and you got new desire. My prayer is for a new desire. Jesus said this. He said, go and learn, Matthew 9, 13, what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So I said, let me go and learn what that means. So it, it took me back to Hosea chapter 6. And in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, it says, for I desire steadfast love. In the Hebrew, the word is chesed. And, and I used to love when my professor would say that word because most of us can't even get our throat to make, get that out. But chesed is the love of God that never ends. It's a steadfast love that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, you can't interrupt it. It's like the love of a mother for her child. And everybody else knows her child is the worst thing at the school. But she loved her child so much she'll cuss the principal out. She don't see none of his faults or none of his wrongs. All she knows is that's my child. And y'all ain't going to mess with it. That's the love of God, this steadfast love that nothing's going to stop it, nothing's going to turn it, nothing is going to change it. He said, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. In other words, don't try to pay me off. Don't come in here bringing me no, no oxen, no sheep. Don't bring me no tithes, and you're not loving people. I need you to learn how to love sinners the way I love them and stop trying to pay me off so you don't have to be around them. Well, we don't eat with them, and we don't hang with them, but we'll give God his and pretend like we are righteous and holy. He says, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. He says, I want you to know me. I want you to have a relationship with me. So how can we know God without knowing his word? You cannot do it. For he says at the end of the chapter, chapter 3, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, if you read the last verse of that chapter, he talks about the word of God. And he says, all scripture is breathed by God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God will be complete. You can't be complete without the word of God. You going around telling everybody, I'm a man of God, but don't know the word of God. You are incomplete. You are a phony and a counterfeit. And I'm not telling you you got to memorize every verse from Genesis to Revelation, but you need to know the word of God better than the average sinner. I know sinners that know the word of God better than most people in my Sunday school class. They quote scriptures verbatim, and it blows my mind. And I wish I was just making this up, but I've talked to them, and I can bring some of them to you. They know the word, but they get drunk every night. They get high every night, but they got the word of God, and they want it. And so my prayer is for them is to have the new desire. And it seems like it's so far away, and it seems like it's so hard to get. And they get it, and they lose it, and they get it, and they lose it, and they get it, and they lose it. They call it relapse, if you've ever been through steps. You know, you got 12 steps, and you get to step six, and then bam, you're back to step one. You get to step eight, and bam, you're back to step one. Get to step nine, ten, bam, you're back. Some guys get all the way to step 12 and go back to step one. How does that happen? 
Somewhere along the way, they lost their desire. And if you're not careful, you will lose yours. You start chasing after money. You start chasing after women. I'm not, I'm going to stop saying that. Start chasing after men. Because the women now is worse than the men. When I was growing up, the men was dogs. But now, oh, the women, they didn't just get into the White House, and they didn't just get into CEO positions, but they acting like men used to act. Got eight, nine different boyfriends. And talk about it. And put it on social media and let you know, yeah, I got three or four, two of them married. And it blows my mind. They have no desire for God, no desire for righteousness, no desire for holiness. But God can give them a new desire. I'm talking to you. I know you've been on that wheel many, many times. But God can get you off of that wheel. It must have took me, I don't know, 15, 16 times of saying I quit drinking before I actually quit drinking. And every time I said it, I meant it. I'm quitting. I ain't never drinking again. And I will go right back. And I'm not talking about drinking like y'all thinking about. Y'all just casual drinkers. Now I wasn't no I didn't know how to drink casually. I'm talking about getting sloppy drunk, throwing up on my shoes, driving the car down the highway, and wondering how I got home. Except for the grace of God. But when I finally did quit drinking, it wasn't something I declared. It was something that God declared because I began to commit my ways to him. And I didn't say, okay, I'm going to stop drinking this day. This is it. I just said, I'm going to start following you, Lord. And as I kept following him, I started looking back to the last time I got drunk, and it got farther and farther away. And a guy told me one time, he said, if you don't remember the last drink you had, then you ain't had it yet. And I understand what he's saying, but I really don't remember the last time I got drunk. But I don't expect to get drunk with wine anytime soon. It's been over 25 years, and I'm not mad about it. I'm glad about it. But you have to have a desire for God. You can't just turn away from, from something bad and then just be neutral. You've got to have something to pull you farther and farther away so it has less and less power. And that's what the word of God does. You need a new desire for God, like a little child again. One day at a time, one verse at a time. Get back to the word. God wants to see us whole again. He wants to see us prospering again. He wants to see us vibrant again. He wants to see us with that joy of the Lord again. He wants to see us with that strength of God. He wants to see us moving in purpose and when the fiery darts come in, you don't even feel it. People say so many things to hurt me now that I don't even know they're saying. I just laugh. And people say, why do you laugh? Oh, that's the way I deal with stuff. I just laugh. Because it ain't working. Jesus went into the grave for us. He hung up on a cross for us. And I don't remember Jesus ever saying, oh, this hurts so bad. Get me down. I don't remember Jesus coming out of the grave and saying, oh, it was so cold and lonely in there. So I, I, I don't remember him even mentioning anything about his pain or his problem. He had such a desire to do his father's will that it trumped everything else. When you go through trials and, and tribulations and temptations and all the things that you go through, we go through it a little bit different than everybody else. Most of y'all think I don't go through nothing because I won't show it. I could be right now going through some stuff that y'all have no clue about and not say a word about it. Because I have no desire to give power to the enemy. I'm going to give glory to God and everything. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. God is good, y'all. 